<clears throat> okay, I think we should start. Thank you everyone for attending this evening. Uh, we are very excited and happy to host this reading with Susanna Sheffer. Uh, Susanna is a close friend of the project. Uh, she is also our access to treatment project coordinator. And we wanted to put this little event together because Susanna just released her first full-length poetry collection called Break and Enter. <laughs> and uh, her poetry chapbook, This Kind of Knowing, was published in 2013, the same year as her nonfiction book about death penalty lawyers called Fighting for Their Lives. And there's so much more I could say about Susanna here, but I, I just want to mention that um, there's a poem in this book, actually, that uh, actually several poems in this book that have been particularly um, inspiring to me as I have worked through some of my own personal writing about the impacts of this work on my own life, particularly um, reflecting on uh, the first summer back in 2008, uh, when I first started at TAVP right out of college and you know was going around the state uh, bearing witness to stories about the death penalty. And I asked Susanna to review a very, very, very rough draft of that essay. And she graciously did and gave me a lot of feedback on it. And then in the process of um, her sharing her own work with me, her own uh, poetry, I found perhaps not surprisingly that there was actually a lot of overlap between what Susanna was writing and what I was writing. And uh, Susanna, I'll just say that in addition to our work together at TAVP on the Access to Treatment Project, I. I so admire you and am so grateful that I get to work with you this closely. Um, several years ago, when I first broached the topic with Walter that we should invite you to be on our board, he said something like, well, she's too busy. I don't think she'll do it or something like that. And uh, I'm glad we reached out to you. And then, like I said, to think that you and I are working so closely now on this project and then even personally on our writing means a lot to me. So thank you. And thank you to everybody who attended. So Susanna will read from her new book and then our colleague Murphy will facilitate some Q and A and then we'll aim to wrap around seven. And if we go over a few minutes, that's okay. If we go under a few minutes, that's also okay. So thank you again, everybody for coming and Susanna, thanks for doing this with us. Well, thank you so much, Gabe. This is already wonderful and i i'm so glad to be doing this reading as a tavp event it, it feels like such a wonderful blend of two really treasured cherished aspects of my creative life or my vocational life to do it that way so in honor of the tavp connection well you'll probably see various kinds of tavp connections in in what i'm choosing to read today but it, i'll start with a few poems that have to do with the experience of listening to and witnessing other people's stories. Open. It wasn't my family that cracked open that day, but it could have been because I held them like glass inside me each time I listened at the window that was open to the world and all that could happen in it. And I heard the yelling get worse and worse until finally the woman screamed, I don't love any of you anymore. So I learned how bad it could get, a globe slipping from someone's grip and shattering. I found out that this is what things could come to and had come to for the neighbors across the courtyard. Anyone could have heard it, so many windows open on a summer night, but there were no sirens because it was such a private emergency and it was nothing I had a right to but I kept it anyway, the shock, the mysterious broken pieces, and the curiosity about what it would be like to hold those pieces up to the light. 
So in that poem, the listening is basically eavesdropping or overhearing. In these next three, the setting is more deliberate or intentional encounter, whether it's an interview setting or more explicitly clinical relationship. Witness. I saw you taste it. I saw when the ocean broke open and you knew like salt in the mouth, this failure was yours. Your job was to save his life and you didn't do it. What is it like? Tell me. You put your hand to your chest to show me this is where I carry it. The heart is not always the place to turn for reassurance. In that gesture, an agony of knowing stones at the bottom of the sea. And then what? What happened next? The last visit. You had to tell him you couldn't stop it. In a few minutes, the guards would come for him. What does it mean that even now the stench of confinement or sudden news or certain scenes in the movies can make you feel as if you are dying? What does it mean that if you sleep at all, you still dream of dread? So much happens that no one sees. I saw this. And sometimes now in my own mind, I make the motions of swimming to try to feel for myself the rise and swell, the promise and peril, the impossible comfort, the salt we sometimes allow each other to taste. And this is when the feelings came. When you broke open, the birds spilled out of you with their sudden wings, that swift rise of anguish. This is what happens sometimes when we forget to protect ourselves. For a moment, those birds were everywhere. What did they know? They only wanted to get away as you did. If only we could choose the type of heartache, the pattern of cracks in the window. Sometimes what I want is just to catch the birds and feel their naked bellies beating in my hands. And this the third of those three is called the limits of responsibility. In this room that is trying to be about safety, we are talking about rooms that were about something else, not refuge exactly, but counting as high as you could until it was over, or trying to take the sounds you heard and build with them, like knives a child bends into sculpture. Maybe. I'm not trying to do anything now except watch the drawing take shape in the air between us. That's not true. I'm trying to do many things. But then someone walks by outside our door carrying a baby, I guess, because those cries enter us like sirens like sirens do when you're trying to have a conversation in a park or a cafe and you wait for the sound to pass, but the sound has its own ideas for you. I see it on your face. I can't pretend this mother and baby haven't broken into the room with us, even as they're already almost gone down the hallway. I tell you it's fine. The baby is fine. Who am I kidding? Cover your ears, wrap your arms around your knees and count to infinity. This is what happened. There's only so much any of us can do. When the Nazis occupied Denmark, the country of Denmark, there was a strong underground Danish resistance that mobilized really quickly to smuggle Jewish Danes into Sweden. Sweden was unoccupied, so it was safer. And by hiding their Jewish citizens in boats and then making that trip you know, across the water to Sweden, smuggling the Danish Jews, the Danes were able to save the vast majority of their Jewish citizens. People say it's over 90%, maybe as much as 95%. Gilalai is one of the small fishing towns on the Danish coast where this took place. And so in this poem, set there a few of the italicized lines which you don't get to see are spoken in the voice of a fisherwoman so i will try to make that somewhat clear when that's happening gilalai in gilalai a street magician pulls an endless chain of scarves from his sleeve and i turn my face to you the way the danes turn their faces to the sun in may the surprise of early love that sweet briny discovery and in the background, the fisherwoman calling out the day's catch. We could turn to talk with her, 
and hear the acrid secrets of the boat she remembers. She was only a young woman then. We spread fish on the deck to disguise the smell, and most of the time no one knew what was hidden in the hold. They saved so many of us, not all, but almost. Fifty years later, the sun is bright in Gilalai. We could lie down right here on this dock, put our noses to the cracks in the wood and smell the sea. We could climb into the boat and feel the rocking, even crawl down to see inside the things this woman knows. I would like, actually, to see that place and feel the brininess of it, that salty taste of fear and refusal. I don't think there's any magic in it, what people will do to each other or for each other. But sometimes the turning matters, the turning toward rather than away. Well, okay, I would like to invite you somewhere else now. I'm imagining that many of you are familiar with Hansel and Gretel, as the Brothers Grimm gave them to us, the story of how the kid's father and stepmother banished them into the forest because there wasn't enough food for everyone in the family, and then how Hansel and Gretel tried to find their way back with breadcrumbs, how they ended up in that dangerous gingerbread house with the witch and finally managed to escape and return home. And what? It seemed to me that that's a lot of trauma for those kids to have been through, starting with the fact that their parents threw them out and weren't honest with them about what was happening. So I wondered what all of that, and specifically the not talking about it, might have been like for them. So I decided to listen for Hansel and Gretel's possible stories in the aftermath. So this is a series of poems, and I'm really kind of enjoying the opportunity to read you the whole series. It's, it's not long, but sometimes I just read one or the other of these. So this way you can see the, the arc of the story, telling that after story. And sometimes the poem's in Hansel's voice, sometimes it's in Gretel's, and sometimes it's in the voice of just kind of an observer, a narrator. I'll, I'll make that clear. The, the first poem, and this one's for Gabe, because it's one of the ones he mentioned. Um, the first poem, I think, could be spoken by either child. I sort of hear it in Gretel's voice, but the actual poem could be either one of them. After an introduction. Home again, and it's as if the forest never happened. No one wants to hear about that great indifference or the lure of the witch house or what we had to do to save ourselves. I understand they won't talk about the hunger, the banishing, how easy it was to be rid of us. So I don't say anything about the forest inside me. I don't tell them that trees grow behind my eyes at night or how I sometimes want to touch the bark because I learn to cherish its rough comfort. I'll do the remembering myself, letting it make of me what it will, as memory does, with its own moonlit trail, breadcrumbs, peril, revelation. Now you may or may not remember that when the parents, the stepmother and father, first go with the kids into the woods, they, they build a fire and tell the children to wait there until they return, though in fact they have no intention of returning. First night in the woods, Gretel. The fire lied to us. I gave it all the twigs I could gather, even when their frailty reminded me of the bones in my hands. I was trying to do my part. I gave the fire what it asked for because I thought the flames were going to all that trouble for us, making a cradle of light and warmth so we could have something like home, even in that forest chill. We waited all night, as we had been told. My brother kept saying we were fine, but in the morning even he could see the fire was like everyone else, only interested in its own hunger. Before we walked away, I stuck my hands in what was left so I could memorize the feel of the ash. You may also remember that when Hansel and Gretel end up in the gingerbread house with the witch, she tries to fatten Hansel up so that she can eat him, uh, but she doesn't see well, and so he tricks her by holding out a, a bone rather than his own finger for her to feel. So, Hansel in the witch house. Inside my cage, I was almost too human to contain myself, but she never knew. 
Yes, I was fat in there, swollen with fear, ripe with everything I had taken in by then. But each time I stuck the deceiving bone through the bars, she cried out that I was so lean and stubborn, I must not be human. She died believing I had managed to refuse everything she was trying to make of me. This one is Dear Happily Ever After. When they walked through the door, turned out their pockets and emptied so many pearls and rubies onto the floor, you were eager to welcome them back. This is what you understood and what you waited for. Now those jewels rest plump and satisfied on the, on the shelves of the house, and you would offer that as proof to any visitor. Look how everything turned out. See what the children were able to bring home. And this is where you would turn away, leave brother and sister sleeping in their beds again, leave well enough alone. So this is when they slip away without you, sneak out at night to search the forest floor for something that feels like fear in their hands. Something makes them want to touch it again and hide it somewhere in the corners of their rooms. Dear happily ever after, I know this is not how you wanted it. They work quickly, whispering to each other. Come morning, they are sitting at the table, wondering if you notice the residue of dirt on their palms. All right, a couple more of these as we see these children trying to work through this and, and make meaning out of what has happened. Hansel prepares for the future. Bread isn't good enough. He understands that now. It's too soft, too porous, too yielding, and he knows now that what is scattered at night can be gone by morning. Whenever he goes outside now, he keeps his eyes on the ground, scanning for something so cunning and indelible that next time someone sends him away, he will have what he needs to resist the thieving world. Well, I said we're going to see them make meaning of it. We know that when children try to integrate an experience, sometimes they do it through play, but sometimes in post-traumatic play, first you see the child just sort of replicating what happened, like telling the story of what happened without fully having worked through it. So Gretel playing. One, I pretend to be a witch. I take what I want and I make no excuses. I pretend to be a witch so I can find out how it feels to love your own hunger that much. Two, sometimes I pretend to be a witch. I watch what the birds and animals search for as they swoop and scuttle and burrow through the leaves. When I see something bright and succulent enough to tempt them, I scoop it up and hold out my hands. The birds and animals come to me and believe they are safe. Hansel at his stepmother's grave. It's not as if I can't understand why you did it. I couldn't stand it either, the house so groaning and bent at the knees, the cupboards with their gaping mouths, our useless hands. And the demon in my belly, the reproach it put on my face, I would have ripped it out if I could have, so I understand why you said we had to go. Did you think we didn't hear you? Even then, we were good at lying still and listening to the sounds the night makes. Did you think that even then we wouldn't try to find our way back to you? Well, maybe Hansel's gotten to a somewhat different place in that poem, and here's Gretel in the final poem, also in a bit of a different place from where she was a couple of poems ago. And for this one, this final one, remember that when the kids ultimately escape the gingerbread house, they, they do it by shoving the witch in the oven that had been meant for Hansel. Witch heart, Gretel. I took it when we left. Not that I was sure it would be worth anything, but I was curious, so I grabbed it from the ashes and dusted it off. It was not exactly like the jewels we stuffed into our pockets, but I thought maybe it had potential. When we got home, I planted it in the meadow behind our house. It took me a while to tell you the truth. I dug a shallow hole at first and I placed the heart there, but didn't cover it. I kept going out each day and checking on it, like I couldn't just let it rest there in the dirt. I thought about what had happened. I thought about how the witch had been waiting all that time in the deepest maw of the forest, as if she had been expecting us, as if she had known all along that there would come a time when our family would cleave open and spill us out and we would have to come looking for her. I wondered what that was like, 
waiting. I wondered if she was disappointed in us now, or jealous, or proud. Eventually I buried the heart deeper in the ground, where even the animals wouldn't find it. I let it take what it needed from the earth and the rain that fell. I was curious to see if anything could grow there. Well, I will change it up a bit now. Give us a little different kind of energy and I'm going to read just a couple of newer poems that aren't in the book because that's sort of fun to do at a reading. And so these are just a couple that are from, they're, they're newer than the book and they're from a series of poems written in the voice of objects that encounter or have encountered human hands. The stone tries to understand the hands. I had not thought shape or comfort or even smooth. I had not noticed myself as singular, but their caress said you in a way that the oceans never did. They held me with a different kind of hunger. In that engulfing, I felt somehow more of myself, not less. I understood how specific the world could be. Well, I'm suspecting that some of you in, in this crowd are familiar with the setup in high security prisons where visits are non-contact, you know, and the prisoner and the visitor visit with a pane of glass separating them and instead of greeting each other with a handshake or a hug, they each put their hands up to the glass, you know, which is separating them. So this speaker in this poem is that glass. The glass. At first, I thought mostly about the job I had to do, getting between them and staying there. Let nothing pass from one to the other, I with the certainty of my literal body. It took me time to understand how incarnate imagination can be and how necessity mothers this kind of invention. I was supposed to prevent it, but I know what I felt. At each goodbye, their heat bloomed through me, and it was not because I suddenly turned porous or derelict. No, I promise I did what I was made to do and what was in my nature. But if you ask what happened in the makeshift gesture my presence required, if I am honest in my accounting, I admit I would have to call it touch. And here's the mug. After a while, I began to expect, no, if I'm honest, I'll say I began to long for that claiming, the way they insisted that it matters how you start things and that taste is itself a kind of praise of the actual world. I longed for their faith and I found it because they did come for me again and again. Each day they came reaching with their, yes, this morning, as well as all the others, their, yes, this again, even though, even when, there I will choose how I'm going to live. The last one of these, the apple, speaking in this poem is a rather famous apple, at least in Western Judeo-Christian culture, and I trust you've heard of the apple, but maybe haven't heard it say this. The apple. The truth is I wanted them to choose me. Disobedience, yes, but maybe something else. Fealty to the complication of their own bodies, the problem of curiosity, taste and see, taste and find out. Before, I mattered only as much as everything else. Now, I mattered more. They made me myself and they made me part of them. And in this new disturbance, we were ripe and full of our desire to know what came next. All right, a transition again, and we are kind of rounding the bend to the last stretch here. Um, I'm going to read a series of 10 very short poems. Don't be frightened by 10, the number 10. Some of them are just a couple of lines. This was a get to do this because it's a TAVP reading kind of thing. Um, and you'll see why. Each of these 10 has a title. It's also the title of one of the black paintings by the Spanish painter Francisco Goya, but it's not that the poems are about the paintings. That's the thing, they're not about the paintings, and it's not even that the poems are written in response to the paintings. What is it then? It's more like the titles of the Goya paintings offer a framing for an aspect of the situation that's being described here. So when there's a first person I in one of these little poems, you can hear it as the voice of a warden, prison warden who's had to oversee executions, and otherwise it's just an observer, narrator or something. So 
as I said, these are short. I'm going to read the whole thing straight through without stopping to introduce each short poem separately. Just, just going to read it straight through. In the Death House, ten of Goya's black paintings hang on the prison walls. Atropos, the fates. At this hour, and for this reason, and by this design, what was it that made me think I could do this? Two old men. One to decree it, and another to make sure it happens. Sometimes afterward, they look down, as if they no longer understand their own hands. Two old men eating soup. Add soup in the evenings at home with their families, wives knowing not to ask about their day, just turning back to the stove. Add soup so they have something to say yes to. Fight with cudgels. Some fight it by saying something at the end. Some fight it by saying nothing. Some fight it by praying. Some fight it by spitting. Some fight it by wearing boots. Some fight it by giving their boots away. Which is Sabbath? When shall we three meet again? Not here, not today. Day of rest, day of mercy, day of we will not do it this time, day of we can't stop thinking about it, day of it wasn't me, day of I was just doing my job, day of someone had to, day of not anymore. When I close my eyes, I see their faces by my bed, watching me try to dream. Men reading. The others reading magazines in their cells, eyes fixed on the pages, not thinking about who goes next. Women laughing. In the visiting room, the aunt, the grandmother, the niece who will end up mute years later and not remember why. Someone says something funny and for a minute they are laughing. They break open and glass spills out. The dog went at the leaves regardless in a frenzy of delight, didn't see the anguish on the people's faces, didn't know what the trouble was with the suddenly beautiful day. Saturn devouring his son. What was it about this particular love that made him turn it into prey? What was it that made him so sure that he couldn't stand to see it on the outside? Fantastic vision. I imagine them in long robes. I imagine them back from the underworld. I imagine them forsaken. I imagine them standing in a circle. I imagine them drinking coffee with me the next morning. I imagine all of us flying through the air. I imagine them forgiving me. I imagine them washing themselves, taking out the garbage, putting their feet up, opening a beer. I imagine myself before I knew anyone like them, running through summers and falling in the soft and easy dirt. Okay, I'm going to conclude now with four poems that are a little more upbeat. Perhaps that's quite welcome at this point. This is called Commitment. Life is the kind of lover who isn't satisfied with just one yes, but needs to know over and over if you will, if you want to, if you really mean it, not just at that first quickening moment, but later and again, today and today. Yes, this dance, this bird in the chest, this hunger, this face to the wind and hands in the mud, and all right, all right, yes, also the salt on the skin, the aching and crumbling, and that doesn't even begin to cover the ways it will tempt you to leave it. But life is the kind of lover who needs to know you have seen it at its worst. You understand what it can do, and still you will still. In the writer Annie Dillard's book, The Writing Life, I don't know if some of you may know her, but in her book, The Writing Life, she tells a story. She tells it like this, a well-known writer got collared by a university student who asks, do you think I could be a writer? Well, the writer said, I don't know. Do you like sentences? So I took that for my title. Do you like sentences? The older writer asked. I do. I like them so much, inadequate ballast though they are. 
The way they feel in my hands, they could be the blades of grass a child selects and lines up one next to the other. They could be full of that much hope, imagination, and longing. Of course, in a pummeling storm, they are only as helpful as ribs are to a heart, which is to say, very much so, but also they have their limits. We believe what we want to believe. Have you ever looked at a rib cage, though? The way it thrusts itself out there, so brave, so ready to try? Have you ever let your fingers feel the shape of those valiant bones? And this one, second to last here, is called Turns Out. We all know how complicated the heart is, how it drives a hard bargain, expects to be swindled, or at least advised that sooner or later it will have to choose what to give up. And that may be. But we all know how complicated the heart is. Turns out there's a chamber where you get to keep everything. The face in the mirror, the bare feet on grass, the time standing still, the fool declarations, the stirring inside you, the soft skin of anguish, the fish leaping from water, the first bars of music, the handprints on your body, your own variation on that sweet human breaking. Yes, the breaking that happens because one person is not simply the same as any other. Well, you can probably tell by now that I like thinking about why human beings do what we do and that I like narrative, story. But sometimes I also imagine what it would be like to experience life in a very different way. So I will close with this poem. After the Psychology Conference is the title. After the Psychology Conference, I like to go to the zoo where it seemed to me that the animals didn't make so much of everything. Wanting was just what they did, their bodies sleek or bulbous or bony, but in any case without ambivalence or grievance or the need to explain so much about it all. Their sun was sun and rock was rock and water, water. And the other animals were only well, maybe their world was just as full of loss and longing and the inexact mathematics of desire, because what do I really know about it? But nevertheless, I would watch them and imagine living without narrative, without that knitting of one thing to another, some kind of story to tell us what or why or how. I admit it was hard to imagine, more unlikely than picturing myself with fur or hooves or claws. Would it be restful? But also lonely, I thought, my hands already reaching for the familiar comfort. So yes, in the end, I went back to it, winding my fingers in the thick weave of chronicle and account. I sank into it again and felt how it held me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susanna. We're going to go to Q&A, but <clears throat> the TAVP staff have reserve the right to ask questions first. <laughs> Staff privilege. Staff privilege. So thank you so much, Susanna. That was really beautiful. My uh, first question for you, I think probably the most important question that you'll be asked today is, can I be a writer? I'm just kidding. I would, <laughs> I would no, never. like lines. <laughs> um, yes. Um, no, you've been very generous in your um, in your motivation for me to uh, to keep trying, even though it's really hard. Susanna, how do you want your work to exist in the world? How do you want it to operate in the world? You know, what do you want? What do you want people to take away from engaging with this? You know, I hearing you read it is so much better, um, so much more powerful than reading it uh, sometimes. So. I know how it applies to my own life and my own writing, but I'm just curious, what do you, how do you want this to exist in the world? What do you want people to take away from it? You know, it's such a thoughtful layered question game. And my answer is not that layered because it's kind of like, I don't know, or whatever people want or something like that. Uh, you know, I, my, 
the joy is in making the poem and then you put it out there and people do what they do. Like you, you right. have spoken an introduction about what some of these poems sort of did for you, how it was, how they were able to connect with your own work and life and so forth. And maybe that happens for others too. And that's wonderful, but it's kind of, you release it, you know, and whatever it. happens, happens. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna pass it over to Murphy. I just wanna echo what Gabe said and thank you so much for reading it aloud. I have about 15 post-it notes around me at my desk, writing down furiously all of the lines I plan on taking with me, like life isn't the kind of, life is the kind of lover. Um, have you ever looked at a rib cage though? Um, just so many wonderful gems that I feel like I've excavated during this time. So I really want to thank you. And uh, I know that this was put in the chat. I just really quickly in housekeeping note, I know that we would love to spend as much time with these questions as we can. So for folks who would like to ask questions, if you go down to the bottom of your screen, there's, uh, there should be the little bar and there will be a couple of different options. And on the right hand side, or the middle to right, I should say, will be a Q&A function. Or if you would prefer, you can put your questions in the chat box as well. Um, and so as folks are doing that and making sure that they too look at their post-it notes all over their desk, thinking about all of the wonderful things that you said, um, I wanted to ask you a question. Um, I know that you say a lot of your curiosity is, you know, why do we do what we do? Um, and so I was curious for you to talk about kind of your writing process and maybe this is a good, um, you know, uh, book ending question for Gabe's, which is about, you know, what you hope happens after the poems are published and shared. But I'd love to hear about your process, you know, starting a poem or even finding something like Hansel and Gretel to reimagine in this wonderful and uh, rich way. So what's your process like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I'm, I feel that making poems is sort of like some other things like making things out of clay, even though I don't do that, but it, I'm, you see some of the images, I'm, I'm sort of taken with the sense of making something, um, or in another way, it's kind of like photography, maybe another thing I don't actually do, but in the sense that you're, you know, there's the whole world out there, and then a photographer kind of figures out what's the bit of it, you know, that I want to capture, and what does my framing do for it, and so each of those things, I guess, kind of interests me. I feel it pretty much like physically as a making, um, but the process can be all kinds of things. I mean, what you know, it's, there's no one answer to that. It could be a line or an image or an idea or something. It can, you know, it can start in different ways. There can be a long gap between having an initial sense of something, but, and it actually being a poem. You know, one of the things I learned really early on um, from, writing badly initially you know, from drafts and stuff is that a bunch of lines is not necessarily a poem. So, you know, you can have an idea, a vivid image, it's something interesting, but it can take a long time for it to really sort of be a poem, to, to figure out what is the poem there. Some of my early workshop experiences were people saying, well, I don't know if saying to each other, I don't know if you found the poem yet, or I don't know if you know what the poem is in that idea that interests you, you know, so the Hansel and Gretel, series in particular, I, you know, I, as you sort of gather, I, I do work with child trauma and other kinds of trauma and so on. And so just the, the, the idea and those, those grim tales have a lot of really hard stuff in them. That's, you know, a lot of people have actually looked at what's in those tales. Um, but the specific, like, they, they come home and it's all just kind of fine at the end of Hansel and Gretel. And so I did have, as I said, I sort of had that, like, just imaginary curiosity. What was that like for those kids? after you know so it just comes as a question um and i had written that the first poem the after poem um then i was a few years ago in a wonderful workshop with the poet oliver de la paz some of you may know his work um, and the workshop was specifically focused on the persona poem where that's a poem where you you write you know you take on the persona of somebody else and so i use that opportunity to develop the Hansel and Gretel series. So sometimes it's like that. Sometimes it's an opportunity to carve out time and actually focus on something that leads you to take an idea and develop it. Thank you. Uh, we've gotten some questions. And so I'm just going to go in order as they appear. And the first is from Ellen Stone. Or um, So 
and the question is, do you remember, Susanna, what first drew you to put your questioning about the world into verse? Um, I, yeah, uh, it, it may be incidents like that one that's told in the poem open, you know, in other words, just sort of being interested in what's happening, being an observing kind of kid. And then, I mean, you don't say this as a child, but sort of having that interest in what could be made out of it. What can you do with this? Not, not that one consciously thinks that as a child. Um, I was born into a family that loved books and words and so forth. So that as a response to the world was, you know, I kind of come by that honestly um, or natively. Um, but yeah, something about making narrative. I mean, in the end, I those zoo animals are fascinating, um, but I don't know how to live without it, you know, with making story out of things. Amazing. Um, and then our next question is also includes a comment about how the poem about the, the Danish Jews was inspiring. Still, I was surprised. Danish Jews, question mark. I have a Danish Jewish friend, but he never told me that story. Where did your interest in this moment of history come from? Mm. Um, yeah, I had learned that the Danes, um, the Danish resistance was really active and strong. Um, I wonder how I learned it. I mean, there's a wonderful children's book about it. Um, uh, so that's you know, the book called Number of the Stars. That may be one example, but I, I, that would have been, I would have read that later. Um, I, you know, I, it's fairly known. Um, in other words, it's not an obscure thing. I don't mean like everyone knows it, but I mean, it doesn't take intensive research. Um, so, uh, you know, it was easy enough to hear. It was actually something that really intrigued me um, about the Danish people. Um, it was one of the reasons I wanted to go spend a summer in Denmark when I was in high school, as well as some of their interesting alternative education stuff that they do. Um, then my husband's family were uh, refugees during that time. So we together became very interested in, or are interested in examples of resistance. Um, so yeah, I think, um, it's uh, it's not obscure. Um, it may not be you know part of sort of contemporary discussion, but maybe again now it kind of is. I'm not sure. Lovely. Um, our next question uh, is uh, begins with saying thank you for these powerful poems, and then continues by saying, "How do you decide how open or how specific to make your poems? It seems to me that some tell a story that's sharp and clear. Some evoke more than they explain." So first, as I read my own memories, desires, fears, rush to fill in the spaces. And then I start to think about other ways in which those spaces could be filled, the other stories the poem might contain, both from the reader's end um, are powerful. How do you decide which approach best serves each poem? This is a very sophisticated group. Um, <laughs> these questions are like, we need, you know, we need a book. Um, how do I decide how specific, you know, oh my goodness, decide. Um, talking about poems gets weird because you end up saying things that sound just so kind of out there, but you know, because what I want to say is like, I don't know the poem tells you and that sounds so like, what is she talking about? But um, you just see what the poem needs. Um, what, what this particular one, like I'm not thinking in generally conceptually, should it tell, should it be specific or not? It's kind of like case by case, if that's, some kind of answer, just seeing what this one is like and having really good workshop or other settings, other opportunities to get feedback on drafts. So sometimes people will say it, you know, you, you have really good readers, early readers, and people will say, I don't think you need that. So that might be an example of having said more initially and then realizing you don't have to, that kind of thing. So yeah, there are some big questions in the chat too. I know. Uh, our next question begins, uh, Susanna, in addition to the title, I've noticed that the metaphor of breaking is quite present in the poems. I can imagine that when choosing the title, uh, you noticed this too. Was that indeed a discovery for you? Did you wonder why breaking is so present or were you intentionally working with the metaphor throughout? Yeah. Um all of that or none of it sort of so now let's see what i'm talking about um i go every year to a wonderful 
conference called the Bear River Writers Conference. Some of the people from Bear River are here, and it's delightful that you are. And so um, several years ago, uh, studying with the poet Marianne Borouche, there was a particular exercise, and I don't even usually love exercises. I can't remember the whole context of it, but it was something where with the word break, we had to we read the definition aloud or something like that. It was some whole thing where something just caught my attention about it, that there were so many different meanings of it. And it, it just kind of got to me. And I did, I think, Walter, if I remember correctly, it may be that I then noticed that I had a couple of poems that were in one way or another you know, breaking because, you know, break open and break, there's so many different meanings there. Um, so I had it in my mind actually that that would be a collection that I was in some way working toward that. So it wasn't like, look at all these poems and see what's the theme and okay, I'll make it the title. I was kind of working toward that for a long time in, in a desultory roundabout kind of way. All right. Um, all right, so I'm gonna go, there's another question um, and it's from Gabe and uh, the question is, Susanna, clearly your work as a trauma therapist influences your poetry. How does your poetry influence your therapy practice? Oh, the other way. I thought it was going to be the first part, right? Um, I don't know if it influenced. Well, mm, no, I lied. Maybe it influences it. Um, not directly, but just, um, yeah, I think this is the answer, Gabe. Maybe. Um, being, uh, thinking in metaphor, being able to think in image, that's actually a really central part of therapy work anyway for for a lot of folks um i find that a lot more people are able to work in metaphor and think in image than you might we might imagine you know we might think that's some kind of like select thing but actually lots uh, very many people almost everybody is capable of it anyway so being able to to listen for image think in metaphor um work in metaphor um let things be non-linear I guess maybe that's the answer to how it influences. Um, mostly it's also just a really good compliment to it because being able to make something out of, this is going the other direction, but make something out of hard things. Um, and yes, Peg is remembering that workshop. Yes, see, this is what's wonderful about having friends from that time. Yeah, something about that. But there was something where we read, we actually read the lengthy definition of break. We went around and did it. And that's a weird thing to do, but this is why people give exercises like that because you're just sprinkling fertilizer. You know, you never know what's going to happen. That just happened to stick with me in a particular way. Much like you were describing in that first question about, you know, people can just take what they want from these poems and do what they will, even with writing exercises or anything really to take and use that fertilizer to, you know, grow something entirely new and different. Or right. I also you... remember that, that, um, I remember that. I remember that that years ago. I see. Look at that, Ella. So much historical confirmation. I love it. Thank you, Ella. Um, yeah. I I also remember that well, when you listen for things, you notice things, you know. And so I remember years ago in a very different TVP appropriate, but not poetry context, having uh, facilitated a gathering of people who've been affected by by murder and execution. I was talking about it with one of the participants, and she said everybody was so raw. We were all kind of broken. She said we've all been broken, and then she said we're all kind of broken open. So just the you know the idea of playing with the different meanings of break. I it was I was just tracking it, I guess, for many years. Yeah. Um. And uh, yeah, I, I think when you're talking about, you know, almost listening and tracking for those things because of the image of on the cover of the book, kind of informing my understanding of break and enter, I was super aware and paying attention to in your first, um, first two poems that you read and even talking about the poems of witnessing that window aspect mm -hmm. um, and what it means for even, you know, the window to be an aperture, looking across the courtyard, I believe was one of the, in one of the poems and listening or eavesdropping as aspects of witnessing. And so um, I know that at least in my curiosity, I'm curious, I guess, I guess my curiosity is how you consider witnessing um, to, to be operating in, in this world of metaphor and image in your mind as well. How it's operating. Yeah. Um, well, you're, uh, you're reminding me too, Murphy, it sort of connects. I have like another thought of, um, 
also about Walter's question then get to yours that Walter was asking also something about was it a discovery about those themes and I was saying well no I was tracking it but it's also a discovery like you have all these sort of separate poems and as the writers in this group know when you go to assemble a collection and particularly when you put the poems in order which is a massively creative act that I didn't understand was a creative act at first but then it I, re I discovered how it is then you notice themes you notice what your own obsessions are. You notice that, yeah, I keep, I'm using this glass a lot of the time. You know, you, you do see it there. Um, and then, then you realize it. Um, so, okay, Murphy, I'm sorry. You were asking about witnessing and how that operates. Yeah. Or what images and kind of the metaphors you find yourself utilizing when you're thinking about witnessing, or even just a deeper understanding of knowing that some of these poems really deal with uh, the aspect of witness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Thank you for repeating. I don't know that I have one image of witnessing, but it's like, that's what you get to do in the poem. I mean, the poem that's actually called Witness, which, you know, has the, your job was to save his life and you didn't do it. And what is it like? And it's so, you know, you all heard and some of you know, I also have the book called Fighting for Their Lives, where I interviewed death penalty lawyers about that. In that book, it's not about my experience of doing that. You know, I'm the whole book is the witness, but then the poem is like my experience of being the witness in a way, you know? So I don't know that it's not really answering your question, Murphy. It's not like there's an image of it, but it's like getting to do that, getting to make a poem out of the experience of witnessing, I guess, in a way. The, I think the reason I'm not finding an answer to the, to the image question is that there's no one image. There would be whatever the image is in the given story. No, oh, absolutely. And I think, uh even when you're talking about putting together the order of some of these poems as well, it made me think of one line where you said narrative is knitting one thing to another. And so the narrative and the order of that, um, of that also. And so, um, yeah. And then I, there's one other, there's one other question in the chat. Um, and it's asking, um, I'm, because this is for TAVP, this is from Walter. Um, I'm wondering if you might address the relationship between the poem Witness and the book on death row, row lawyers. Right, which I, okay, I didn't even say, and yes, I was just beginning to say that. Um, the relationship between them is, yeah, that I, it's pretty much as I said, I suppose, um, although happy to talk more, but um, I, the, the, the person in the poem, the you in the poem is kind of a composite. Do you know, it's not, it's, uh, various people's and it's not one individual it is a composite but you don't you have to write it as specific um but it's my experience yeah it's it's a little more my own experience of it in a way that couldn't be in the book so that's the relationship i think companion and then uh one of the many pleasures in your poems are in the quiet surprises the turns and unfoldings do these surprises show up in the process of writing the poems or do you have an idea ahead of time Ah, okay. So much to say about that. Um, you know, by definition, if it's a surprise, you, you want to be surprised. It's great when the writer is also surprised. A lot of people more eloquent than I have written about that, about, you know, they say no surprise for the writer, no surprise for the reader. Some of my friends may know who that's attributed to. Um, you know, uh, Linda Gregerson, who many of us remember studying with, would talk very much about that, about sort of experiencing the surprise when you're writing, but then the complexity of that is not that you then don't revise. It's not like your poems are just the first draft, but that you do, a poem should surprise the writer too. You should, well, should is a big way to say it, but it, there's a great pleasure anyway in being surprised yourself. Um, you know, fiction writers, novelists, I was talk about my characters told me that, you know, and I'm just listening to my characters, I'm taking their dictation. I don't really know what they're gonna do when they go do their, you know, all that stuff. I don't write novels, but poems are kind of like that they they do what they want to do and so you can very much be surprised as the writer and enjoy that um, then of course you it doesn't mean you don't still shape it and work it and revise it of course absolutely well thank you so much i'm making sure that everything in, in the q a has been addressed and i think that you've done a wonderful job and i'm so grateful for all of this time and all of these wonderful answers as well I'm going to pass it over to Gabe. Thanks, Murphy, and thanks, Susanna. And thank you, everyone, for coming out on a uh, Tuesday evening. 
We dropped a link to a local online bookshop where you can buy Susanna's book. If you haven't already, I would highly encourage you to do that. Um, please stay in touch with us. Um, at TAVP, we're, we're uh, trying to do more of these events and we have a couple coming up, um, including potentially another poetry reading by uh, our writer in residence, Jorge Renault. Um, and hopefully Susanna, um, you'll, you'll uh, want to do this again sometime as you continue to, as you continue to write and create more poems. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, as I said before, um, please stay in touch with us. Um, you can find us online at texasafterviolence.org. It seems like everyone knows Susanna already, so you can stay in touch with Susanna. And thank you again, Susanna. I, I'm really um, happy that you, uh, that you did this with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's the perfect forum. And this is recorded, so you'll, you can find this, we'll likely put it uh, somewhere on our YouTube or on our Vimeo, uh, so you can share it with friends who weren't able to attend tonight. So thank you again. Have a good evening. Have a good week. Take care of yourselves, and we'll see you soon. Thanks, Susanna. Thank you.